Good. I know you probably shared how your day was before we got here, but I'm I'm in the office all day, so seven to four. Air condition and you know, not that much with the weather and trying to find people to go with me on the beach because it's hard to go by myself alone. I don't know. I hate it to be myself by myself. Mm -hmm. So maybe we will one day we'll make a group and go together to the beach. <laughs> we should. We definitely should. I'm down. We can have connect group in person in the evening. <laughs> Sounds good. Yeah. Might as well um, check in with you guys on that. What do you think about uh, switching to in person? I'm like flexible. I can go either way. There's convenience. There's a lot of convenience with the Zoom thing because you can do it anywhere. But there's advantages to in person too. So if you guys think we ought to switch at any point to in person, let me know because I'm flexible on that. Yeah, my personal thought is it's been really nice doing just a video, um, just because like it takes me two minutes to set this up rather than drive in like thirty minutes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, it's it's a, it's a significant amount of my day. Um, but once in a while, it'd be nice to do it in person. I think that'd be kind of a cool way to do it. Like that sounds good. In blue moon. Like how like our default default would be on Zoom, but once in a while we'll do an in person. That sounds good. We split 50-50. Two weeks together and two weeks on Zoom. Because for me, like I'm all day on the computer. I'd love to meet people and talk to them. Mm -hmm. Some people it's hard for them to drive. I know. Yeah. Well, um we could always I like do we could always do some, whoever it's convenient for can get together at other times, whatever, you know, make some uh, separate appointments, yeah. something like that. So are you starting to say something, Kyle? Or no, I was just saying, I, I personally agree with Norman. I like the, I like the Zoom, um, but yeah, I'm totally down to, to meet in person every once in a while. So that's cool with me. All right, cool. We'll think about that some more and um, maybe uh, inject some, uh, some in-person meetings in the future. Uh, I think uh, at this point though, it probably we're not gonna have any other people join, so might as well run the video. Um, I don't know if any of you guys took a look at it, but um, just as an introductory thing, uh, basically there's, most people don't realize that science has really kind of lost its, has lost the plot. And there's two different ways, there's at least two different ways in which they claim that you don't have free will, okay? One is that your, all your decisions are made by your brain. And all those decisions are a result of pre-existing brain chemistry. You know, that sounds ludicrous, but, you know, because of that naturalistic viewpoint, they can't bring themselves to consider the possibility of a soul, also known as a mind, right? But I think uh, there has been very good evidence produced that shows that we do have a mind that's separate, a soul, that's separate from the brain. My theory, nobody has to accept this, but my theory is that there's a circuit that goes through the brain. So it uses the brain like a tool, like a pianist would use a piano or something. But on in certain occasions, it can bypass that. It can bypass going through the brain. And uh, that would be like near-death experiences uh, where people get jarred and they're pretty much dead. They're pronounced dead. And then they come back to life. There's consistent reports of activity when the brain is dead. The brain is zero, you know, they, they register zero activity in the brain. But then the person will come to later and they'll say, I rose above it. And by the way, number 126 was on top of that ambulance. You know, that's information they couldn't have got, gathered otherwise. There's all kinds of other, they, they, they reported conversations that were going on down the hall in a different room of the hospital. One girl reported conversation her family had in detail that was like over a mile away, you know? So something happens, there's certain unusual circumstances where it seems that you can bypass your brain and complete the circuit. And, and I also think that there may be something like that going on with autistics, autistic savants that, have, that are super intelligent about certain things. For example, there's this autistic savant in England named Derek, who's basically like a, thinks like a three-year-old, except he can play anything on piano like you play mozart 
Chopin, Stravinsky, <laughs> Tchaikovsky, and they can tell him like, okay, how would Tchaikovsky play the blues if he was to play the blues? And he'll do a he'll do a hybridization of Tchaik Tchaikovsky. Anyways, the point being, extreme genius sometimes, but when he's going through his brain, he becomes retarded because the brain is damaged. That's my theory. So when the site when the circuit has to go through the brain, it gets this it has to go through this jammed up, damaged thing. So that's why he comes off as very slow and so forth. But there's times where it can bypass. Now I'm still developing that theory. I'm not sure about all the details, but um, the the most important point is that I think we have good evidence from science that we have a mind that is separate from the brain, and it can actually influence the brain, which we'll see in the video. Um, I want to. Physics also says you don't have free will for a different reason. They believe that the universe is a block universe where everything that has happened has already been determined. Now, not all physicists believe this. I'm just saying some of them believe this, right? And I think if most people understood what they believe, they'll be like, that's nuts. You know, they believe that the future is the same as the past. It's already played out. So you don't really have free will. You're just, you're just completing that block of, of uh, future time, right? You're going through it. You have the illusion of free will as you go through it. That's a that's a very um, common viewpoint in physics. I think that's wrong. I think the other one's wrong, and this video will show some of the reasons why. Any questions before I fire it up? Um, okay. I think I think that's that's you know hidden thing in the brain. Maybe it's related to the soul. Because when the soul like goes out of the body, <clears throat> where they can see, that's what they seen. And I, I heard there's many stories that they dead. They they are, like you know people, they consider dead. And when they came back, they tell stories about they saw somebody, they saw something, mm -hmm. and and that's true. Like that's reported as 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 a fact. So I don't know, is that related to the soul that some, you know, scientists, which is they don't believe in God, they start to believe in God because they couldn't find any explain of the brain, how it's complicated and how to connect with the other world and how to connect with even other people. Like some people, they do have this kind of power that they can see behind the wall. They can talk to people in, you see, I don't know if you see those some of those shows that he can tell you what's in your pocket or what card, you know, playing card are you carrying? Well, Maybe kind of this room of, we don't discover it yet. We don't know anything about it yet. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's, uh, that's kind of hard to i'll just i'll just throw out one real quick thing that i think well nah i think it's gonna muddy the water too much let me just let's just run the video and then we'll talk some more about it after we run it here i'm getting too carried away all right just a second i'm sharing the screen am i not i'm not sharing the screen now i'm sharing the screen can you guys see it Viewpoint 
that there is no such thing as mind. It's not that the mind is explainable by matter. It's just that the mind doesn't exist at all. It exists at all. The one thing almost everyone accepts is that we actually exist. We're persons, not just a collection of body parts. We have a self, an inescapable I. I have a brain, but I am not a brain. I feel emotions, but I am not an emotion. I think thoughts, but I am not a thought. Who are you? Think about it. Who am I? Most people feel they're more than their physical bodies. What materialists don't tell you is this feeling is actually supported by science. Recent research has revealed fresh evidence for an immaterial mind, where thoughts actually change your brain. Dr. Jeffrey Schwartz treats people who suffer from obsessive compulsive disorder. His treatments provide evidence that thoughts can change our physical brains. By training people, literally training them to reinterpret the feelings that you need to check or that something is dirty, reinterpret it as a false message from your brain. People could, in fact, learn how to understand that this is not me. This is a false message from my brain. And when they did that, their OCD improved and their brain changed. That's the part where you really get the leverage to say you're not just your brain because choices you make can actually change how your brain works. This research clearly supports mind over matter. Mind, mind over, over matter. matter. Further evidence for an immaterial mind comes from an operation known as a corpus callosotomy. In this operation, you literally cut the brain in half by severing the corpus callosum. This operation that I've performed, and the brains were essentially cut in half. But they still seem to be a unitary oh. person. They still seem to be fairly normal. And what that implies is that the human mind is not purely uh, generated by the matter of the brain. Otherwise, cutting the brain in half would have profound effects on you know, it might make two people. Certainly, it would, it would create a, a rather profound difference in the person's state of consciousness, and it doesn't. A third piece of evidence for an immaterial mind comes from brain stimulation experiments that seem to show our intellect and identity are not found in our brain tissue. Some of the most famous of these experiments were conducted by brain surgeon Wilder Penfield. He was a meticulous scientist. He repeatedly observed that there were aspects of the patient's mind that no matter what he did to the brain, he couldn't affect. You know, he, could, he could elicit memories by stimulating part of the brain. He could make a muscle move or make a patient have a sensation. But he couldn't change uh, their consciousness. He couldn't change their intellect. He couldn't change their sense of self. That no matter what he did to the brain, remains. A fourth piece of evidence for an immaterial mind comes from experiments about free will. Materialists try to convince us that free will does not exist. I hope to convince you that free will is an illusion. Free, free will is an illusion. But Dr. Benjamin Leibitz's experiments show that humans do have free will. At least the free will to say no. About perhaps half a second before you decide to do something, there's a spike in your brain that he called the readiness potential. It's almost like an unconscious moment. Materials have used this readiness potential to suggest that we are misled into thinking we have free will. Free, free will is an illusion. That our material brain just sort of makes the decision. And we kind of think that we decided. But we didn't. Leibitt didn't agree with that. He asked the subjects to do something more. He said, when you decide to do something, then decide not to. When they did that, he found that there was a readiness potential for deciding to push the button. But there wasn't a readiness potential to decide not to push it. And he said, he didn't prove the existence of free will, but he proved the existence of free want. That's what he called it, free want. That in the sense we have motives that are beyond our control. We can't stop the motives, but we can stop ourselves from doing it.
Materialist scientists mostly ignore this evidence because it doesn't support their worldview. You are cellular ro ro robots. Materialists are realists in a sense. They understand that materialism cannot explain the mind. Rather than abandoning materialism, they abandon the mind, which uh, I think is a mistake. Neuroscience shows that you are more than your brain. This liberating evidence frees us to think rationally about who we really are, body, soul, and mind. We are not materialists. We see the human soul. We experience love. We live with purpose. We fight for justice. We are the quiet majority, and we will be quiet no longer. screen share. Hi, Annette. Hello. All right, anyway, thoughts on the videos? On the video? Yeah, um, I mean, the video for starters, just being like a million percent honest is not something <clears throat> that is easy to follow. Uh, <laughs> um, as a guy who did, gets distracted uh, fairly easily, um, that was difficult. Uh, I think the experiments would be cool to have a more subtle explanation of, because I think there was some pretty interesting uh, points there, um, specifically like what the decision moment or something like that, moment of decision-making or something like that. Um, and then what leads up to it. And then once you make your decision, like there's pretty much no turning back, right? Like, no, that's, yeah. that's exactly what they proved the opposite of that. They said, so that's a, there's a readiness potential that they noticed on the uh, MRI trackings it's right before the decision. So they, some scientists thought, oh, that proves that there's no free will, that the, that readiness potential was coming up and that was leading you to that decision. Right. But then when he said, try to not make that decision, they were able to do it and there was no readiness potential that showed up for that. So we do have free won't that proves, right? I think free won't is free will. It's just, it's just a mirror image of it, you know? To have free will, the most important thing is to be able to delimit. I will, I will not do X, I will not do Y, you know? I refuse this, I refuse that, I reject that, you know. It's just a mirror image of free will, right? You know. Not to mention, um, I'll, I'll just kind of recap my understanding of it and hopefully language is easier to understand. Um, this is this hits home to me a little bit because my daughter's been going through this with uh, TBS. She had three concussions in a fairly short period of time. So she had to do TBS, which is transcranial brain stimulation where they, they put electrodes on your brain and they ask you to proactively think certain things in order to encourage the brain to start behaving more normally. Because in my daughter's case, one of her hemispheres was kind of asleep. The other, one hemisphere was doing all the work, the other side was asleep, right? So they wanted to get it back in balance where both sides are carrying equal shares of load. So there was routines they put her through with this, like encouraging it with uh, magnetic stimulation you know, through the electrodes, you know? But her thoughts were key in that to getting her brain right again. And as there was also those uh, examples I mentioned in the video of people with obsessive compulsive disorder, right? Um, if you, they train people to think certain ways and certain thoughts and certain patterns and interpret thoughts in certain ways, which is something your mind is doing. You're, you're using your free will and your mind to do this, right? Which to me is a soul. When I say mind, soul, that's the same thing, mind, soul, right? But it's not the same thing as your brain. Your mind works with your brain and works through it, but uh, it's not uh, synonymous with it, right? So you can use your, your soul slash mind, whatever you want to call it, to manipulate your brain, to change your brain, 
And that's, they, they showed with the MRI tracking people with obsessive compulsive disorder, they would have them think certain thoughts deliberately and they would track the progress and they would, over time, their brain changed and they, they were able to end their obsessive compulsive disorder by going through this therapy and having their mind, i.e. their soul, direct their, their brain and uh, conduct therapy in their brain. It's called neuroplasticity, where you're able to change your brain by deliberately thinking certain thoughts. Right? But that shows there's two different elements there. You know, There's this, this thing that's more like a piano, like a tool that's being, that gets played, but there's something a little heavier that's one step more primary, and that's your soul. The, the essence of yourself, your being, your mind. I, I feel that um, something that I, it, to this day, will still struggle with, um, but I feel like I've come a long ways with it. Um, is it kind of is kind of tied in with like guilt and shame and like in and like unforgiveness of myself, like not forgiving myself, even though God has forgiven me. Um, and literally that is what um, kind of helped me turn things around is because I would, I was like, I, I've always struggled with like hanging on to things and then worrying and but it was, it's like, literally, I feel like I have to, tr I have to tell myself <laughs> I don't need to worry. Right. And when, where I get, where I get that ability to tell myself is when I read the word of God, which says, do not worry, which says your sins are forgiven, you know? So literally I'm using, it's almost like soul food to train my brain, which sometimes that I, I feel like it might be different for all of us. Like sometimes your brain is telling you something um, and you feel so strongly about it, <laughs> but it's like, it's, it take, for example, and this is um, like pornography, right? Like when I, there was a time where I was addicted to it and like your brain tells you that you want it. Right. And you fight it. Mm -hmm. um, and so situations like that, you know, you're going to tell yourself not to, or like, but for me, like, like worry, like it, it might would I would feel like I need to worry about something, um, and even to this day, I, I it's like I get, I get this like feeling. This like I, there has to be something in my mind that I'm worrying about, but I have to tell myself not to. Um, so yeah, I, I feel like it is two different things. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I just, I just relate to what you're saying, so. Yeah. So to use a car metaphor, it's almost like the, the motor is, is your brain, but the steering wheel is your soul, right? Or something like that. Like there's a continuum that's constantly going like the motor, you know, it's running, you know, and it does its things. It's doing its automatic things like our breathing and our heartbeat and, you know, bioregulation, all their systems are, you know, keeps all those things running, but it's kind of dumb, you know? And if you want to get to a precise place, you're going to need to use that steering wheel and the, maybe the, the gears and the transmission and all that, right? You're going to have to use the other tools. The, the, that's the way I see it. It's kind of like the brain is kind of like our engine. It's not going to do any, it's not going to do much on its own. It'll take care of like the keeping our heart beating and, you know, keeping all the systemic processes going, but it's not going to do anything sophisticated on its own. It's only when we tell it to, when we, we direct it, we direct it towards what we want to direct it to using our, our free will, our volition. Right? It's pretty amazing the situation we find ourselves in with science being in that state, because I don't know if you guys have thought this through before, but when you think about it, the idea that you have no free will, no thinking adult should ever say that. That's a really stupid statement, you know, because the easy rebuttal is, well, what did you use to draw that conclusion? You, you, you somehow, you have no free will and somehow you're sure about what happened. That's self-refuting. If you have no free will, then you can't tell me anything because you don't control your, your thoughts, your minds, your actions, your body. You know, I, I can't take anything seriously from you. you know? If anybody has no free will, then they don't have the free will to derive an opinion. 
They don't have the free will to reject bad syllogisms, bad conclusions, and accept good conclusions. They're just a victim of their circumstances, a victim of their previous brain chemistry. And when you see somebody who knows what they're talking about debate him, like Sam Harris debating William Lane Craig, they get their butt kicked because it's really kind of a ludicrous, a ludicrous claim. Yeah. But if you think of science as like, like an institution, there's a tremendous number of people that believe this stuff. They believe that you have no free will. They somehow, you know, it's kind of the frog in the blender thing. They've kind of drifted into it laterally, but that to me, I think that was the, that may have been the first thing that made me 100% sure that there's a God. So I remember um, debating back and forth with my communist political science professor way back, way back when. Um, and I, and you know, at the end of at the end of the semester, he was talking. Let's talk about the heavy stuff. Let's talk about God and atheism, blah, this and that. You know, he was an atheist, and I made the case. I said, I think, you know, when I go, I, when I feel the free will, like I go surf. I want to go surf. I don't have to go surf. It's not a matter of my survival. It's a matter of, I decide that, okay, this three hours I have available, I can afford to invest my time in going and having some amusement. And I just go through all the, the process and go and look at all the decisions I'm making. I'm rejecting options and accepting other options. And then rejecting options, accepting a, a certain option and rejecting. If I have the ability to accept and reject right and left, clearly I have free will and nobody lives as if they don't have free will. But th that's the official position of a lot of scientists is that we don't have free will. Kind of crazy. I think you gotta be careful with your language of what free will actually means, right? Cause like you could say, you someone could say that you don't have free will and take your surfing uh, passion, for example, right? Like you know you want to go surfing that's a really good easy casual example right like pretty low risk not a lot of good or bad that comes out of it like it was just a ca very casual decision that you made right mm -hmm. and so it's really easy to kind of portray that as if it's like your own free will because there's not a lot of stakes involved right like you made all the decisions there you either go out have fun or Maybe you could stay inside and do something fun, right? Maybe it was a competition between surfing and I don't know, like picking out and watching a movie. Sometimes that can be fun too, right? Mm -hmm. But that decision doesn't necessarily show free will when someone could argue that you were locked into that decision from the get-go, that you were mildly interested in going surfing. They're not going to say you were so passionate about going surfing. They're not going to say that argument because you can be locked in at like a 51% interest of going, let's say it only took like a 50% threshold of like, yes, I'll do this versus, you know, 49%. No, I won't. And then 50%, who knows what would happen at that. But, you know, maybe you're at that 51% interest of going surfing, but you were locked in and predestined to have that 51% interest. Doesn't sound that interesting. Doesn't sound like it's very high stakes. You know, like when people bring free will into situations like murder, then it's really contrasting, right? It's like, oh, I didn't have, you know, the free will to murder that person, or I was predestined to murder that person, or it was all on my own. I, I made the decision to do it. You know, like I, th I think that argument is a lot more like violent. For people to understand but yeah a casual uh example is is going to be interesting when you bring that up to someone who thinks that you are just locked into it um <clears throat> maybe maybe it's someone who thinks that you're locked into it uh by some spiritual force that we can't control maybe that's their understanding or maybe they think it's some uh chemistry going on in your brain or uh, and a lot of physicists also believe this. Maybe it's just something that we don't quite comprehend, um, could, which could just be labeled as spiritual influence, right? For the predestined argument, uh, like no no free will um, argument. Uh, Are you talking about the free the, will argument? Huh? The time thing I mentioned, the B block of time. 
Is that what you're referring to with that reference? Or so when you said free will, are they the um, determinism or? Predestined. Uh, predestined. predestined. Is that your reference to predestined? Are you referring to biblical stuff or are you referring to that block universe I mentioned or something else? Um, maybe an abstract of predestined because I'm just saying like, it could be the chemicals in your mind that predestined. It's it, oh. some force, right? That locked you into it, right? That force could be physical, could be spiritual, could be something that we don't understand and we just call spiritual. Okay. Um, so that that's like maybe ways that it could be interpreted. Uh, and then free will, yeah, it, like maybe there is some overlap between, or like a Venn diagram, right? Of like your actual physical mind functions and capabilities that it has, or not mind, I'm sorry, uh, brain, right? Functions and capabilities that it has, and then your mind, right? And then maybe your convictions, who knows what the Venn diagram really looks like. You'd have to study it. I haven't studied it. Uh, haven't studied any of this. I just have like very unresearched opinions. Um, uh, I but I do understand. Good exercise. The, Venn, the Venn diagram thing, that would be a good exercise to like make a one part the brain attributes, another thing, what you think the soul attributes are and see if there's some overlap. You know. Well, it's assuming that there would, yeah, there you go. Yeah, it's assuming that there would be overlap because otherwise it's just going to be three circles and it's like, mm -hmm. okay, <laughs> you know, um, yeah. and three is just an abstract number. I mean, I, I, I think like that's my opinion on it, but could totally be wrong. Don't really care that much. Not a lot invested into that. Um, closing remarks on my soapbox right now uh, is uh, this has been debated for as long as humans have been thinking of philosophy. Um, we're not gonna land on like a decision tonight here at this Bible study group, you know, or, uh, you know, reasonable faith group, but it's interesting to talk about nonetheless. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'm not, I'm, I, that's just long-winded to say, I don't know, you know, some good I can see both sides. Some good food for thought. I thought, you know, yeah, that was good. Uh, good triggering. It was good. Good, interesting. I think from the Christian perspective, we're probably a little bit more, I mean, I know this is even controversial and whatnot, but even more lined up with like free will. Um, that's just my perspective as a Christian. Uh, lined up but, with free will meaning, what do you mean by that? What, what do you mean? Uh, like, as a Christian, I think we have uh, just people in general have uh, free will, um, whether it comes to their salvation or uh, even small things like surfing, right? Um, I, I think generally speaking, we have free will, uh, but there are some Christians who don't believe that. And I mean, it just gets complicated. And there's also moments where you could you know re reintroduce that venn diagram where it's like well does god control us at some times and does that count as true free will or conditional free will or like i don't know some subset of free will maybe that'd be easier to explain but mm -hmm. i don't know i i can't really see no free will being super viable to be from my perspective i agree 100 percent. that would be the whole thing would be a ridiculous puppet show if there's no free will and for whose benefit, you know, I don't, I don't see why God would do that, you know, just make a big puppet show and he's really controlling everything, but he's pretending we're controlling it. Uh, that to me makes no sense. I mean, but, I, I'm saying that's how some, some people believe. Yeah. But if you introduce the idea of the butterfly effect, where it's like, well, if God did create everything, did he accidentally create things no okay well if he intentionally designed every single thing and we are the way we are right now it's because of, of you know some initial thing that happened uh initial moments and then everything else kind of fell into place the way it was supposed to fall into place if you believe in the butterfly effect right so that's an interesting argument against free will entirely if you if you really think of that um, and how uh, God created everything. And yeah, I don't know. Thoughts on that? I'm not sure. I, I don't understand how that would militate against free will. 
So the butterfly effect, right? So like we know if a butterfly flapped its wings, it could cause a hurricane just out of like a series of events that we can't understand, right? Well, if God created uh, everything with his own plan initially, right? Mm -hmm. And then things ran its course. Well, it all depended on that initial state, right? Like everything depended on the initial state that God designed things to be. Um, if God designed it like just a little bit different over thousands of years, all the results, or maybe billions of years, depending on how you view God's creation and uh, how the mechanics of that kind of works and different arguments there and whatnot. But mm -hmm. uh, the series of events would be different uh, over time uh, if one thing was changed, right? Uh, is like the arguments of the butterfly effect uh, and, and how that works big picture. And if that's the case, then influences that affect our decision-making process were predestined to happen due to just the initial state of how God created things. Um, so like maybe for instance, okay. Okay. So there's the immaterial thing, the things that don't have a soul, all the material, actually the material things, all things that don't have a soul. I could accept that they would follow the course of de determinism based on the initial conditions of the big bang and everything's just unfolding as the universe expands. Okay. There's, so there's all kinds of mindless stuff that's doing its thing, but within that continuum, there's all these creatures sprouting up like seeds with with free will right there's these souls that keep sprouting into this mix and they have an influence on it too and some of them might be the influence as to why you feel the pressure to decide one way or the other so we have the so it's good to, i think it's good to think of it in two different as two different packages that overlap right there's all the material stuff that's going on that's unfolding and stuff and then there's all those souls that are popping up within that and they are having activities too. And we have to incorporate that as well, right? But what I'm saying is those souls and, and their free will, you're kind of interjecting that they do have free will for that argument to, to exist, right? But if they didn't have free will, then their actions that affect you would also have been predetermined, right? If, if things are predetermined. Again, mm -hmm. um, like another example of this would be, going back to non-living things or maybe living things, but not in the traditional sense of what we consider living, um, like with a soul. Uh, let's say like, I didn't know that I wanted to live in Hawaii until I saw Hanama Bay. Let's say that was like a decision-making factor. It was like so beautiful there that I was like, I've got to stay here. And then through staying here, I started affecting someone else's life. But if Hanama Bay didn't exist, it was just, of a beach all around here in Hawaii, you know, like, no, I'm going to pass. Like I could just live in Arizona and get the same effect. So I'll just move mainland and I won't affect those people that I would have affected if Hanama Bay existed. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and maybe the effect that I have someone, so the effect that I have on someone, uh, is consequential to how, uh, you know, they live their life. Like maybe I influenced them to not be depressed. Maybe I influenced them to go surfing with me or something like that, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I'm sure you're tracking all that and like have thoughts about that, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah I just uh, what are your thoughts before Steve annihilates it? Yeah. <laughs> For for that last part, were you like I understand what you're saying, but were you saying that in favor for free will or against free will? That would be an argument that someone could easily make against free will. Yeah. Unless I missed something, which is possible I did. I feel like that would be an argument for free will. Because our decisions that we are making. And yes, the, you know, the butterfly effect, I can see how one thing leads to the next. 
And so is it really free will when one thing is influencing to the next? But also I feel like, I guess like, um, I think I, f I feel influenced a lot, but I, I know that I can go against influence. So. Are you going against influence or were you predestined to go against that influence in the beginning, right? Yeah, that's like, see that. yeah I'm that's, sorry. That's but a, that's, yeah. No, that's a rabbit hole. We're redefining a predestination to say predestined. But <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The classic yeah. philosophical thought experiment on this is you could be a brain in a vat and a mad scientist is just manipulating you and you think all your desires are your desires, but those are all stuff he's injecting into the picture, right? And you think you're going through life and experiencing all these physical things, but it's all just, you're in the matrix, you're being manipulated by a mad scientist, you know? And it's a good thought experiment to think about, you know, okay, how much could they get away with? Or could you actually determine and figure out there's a mad scientist manipulating my brain? So Descartes, as probably you guys have heard of Descartes, famous philosopher, you know, he, he uh, kind of wrestled with this kind of issue and, and thought, what can I be 100% sure on? And there's no doubt whatsoever. And that's where he boiled it all down. Universal skepticism, universal acid of skepticism boiled it all down to, I think, therefore I am, right? And that's a, that's a, pretty, tough, that's a pretty tough one to disprove because if you think, it's kind of a necessary condition of thinking is that you exist, right? That's super, obviously that's a really simple, super simple statement, but, and then he started, so that's the, he, he boiled it down to that's, okay, that's the one thing I can be sure about. Even if there's madness and witchcraft and mad scientists and whoever, whatever, whatever manipulations I'm under, I know for a fact, 100% undeniable that I am, I exist. I think, therefore I am. <laughs> Even if my thoughts are not mine, if they're being manipulated, I can be 100% sure that I am, I exist. And then build outward from there. What else can I be 100% sure of? And then, you know, he started building out from there, right? It's kind of a good process in, in a certain philosophical way, just a good exercise. You know? Yeah, it runs into, uh, so I really like this subject, by the way, like something I'm very passionate about, or not passionate about, but interested in, because it like gets the gears turning and, you know, thinking of easy flaws in our language, our ways of thinking, like how we define certain terms. And uh, mm -hmm. I think therefore I am. So that's a statement that I think can easily be used in the same way that E equals MC square is used in the sense that people don't really understand like the mechanics of what's going on there and, and why it's such an impactful statement. Um, mm -hmm. Could you, for the sake of me too, because I, I, I have looked into that saying and, and what it actually means. Could you further expand upon what that means? Sure. Um, the car Your best understanding of it. Yeah, he was like um, in the, this was like, you know, Renaissance enlightenment time there. They're really like, what can we really boil it all down to? What can we be hundred percent sure of? So he was trying to put everything through that grid of that skepticism, that universal asset of skepticism. Can I doubt, it? is there a way to doubt it? If I can doubt it, get it out of the sight, you know? Get it out of the picture. So he just kept eliminating, eliminating, eliminating everything he could eliminate, anything about which he could have doubt. But he said that finally he could not have doubt about that fact, that no matter what, if he's thinking thoughts, that requires as a necessary condition his existence for him to think any kind of thoughts, whether they're fictional, whether they're nonfiction, to, to think any kinds of thoughts. You must exist. You cannot think thoughts if you don't exist, right? So he's saying, at least I know that, at least I know that if I'm thinking thoughts, I can be 100% sure I exist. And then we can build from that point. I can be that, I can be 100% sure of, right? So like can you a roundabout way of saying self-inferring your existence, like you're thinking of your own existence, therefore- It's a good way to put it. You yeah, probably it's exist, right? Um, self-evident, yeah, it's self-evident. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that, that is pretty cool. It's a little tricky to talk about that necessarily, but. Mm -hmm. I'll um, just throw it out as a challenge. Does anybody think they can pro propose a way to doubt that? You know what I mean? 
use all the creativity you can muster. And can you think of any like questions you could ask to like bring to doubt that I exist? Yeah. Tough one, right? <laughs> I haven't it doesn't it. matter that you're thinking of things like, yeah, you, you have thoughts, but are you the originator of those thoughts? You know, if, if everything was, what, what was that? That's not the question though. I could be. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that you exist. Again, it's, it's a silly use of like the word existence, right? You could also say like, are we loosely using the word existence? What does it mean to say exist? Like mm -hmm. physically be here? Well, there's also a lot, I'm sure you're well aware of like the whole entire argument in philosophy of like whether our physical bodies are real or not. And then, you know, like uh, idealism, the idea that we're in a, a matrix or a, a, some kind of a illusion or something. Yeah, yeah. So I guess maybe you could say like your thought is the only thing that exists and that's what you mean by I think therefore I am, which is just your your mind maybe, right? I think you're saying um, at least, at least there is, there is an I in the picture that is thinking these thoughts, even if you're a mad scientist generating fictional thoughts, there still is an I that's processing those thoughts, right? That's fair. Yeah. Okay. So I think it'd be unwise to maybe argue that point because also he's famous for that saying for a reason. It's a pretty good saying, right? Um, pretty tried and true since the medieval ages, right? Uh, <laughs> well. Yeah. Not going to solve it here at uh, this, this discussion group. But could you argue that that's the only thing that truly is assertable or like no. provable? No, I think that's just that's just the most provable. That's the easy starting point because it's so undeniable. I think you can't deny that. But there's other things you can you can prove. I think um, I think free will is is something that you can systematically prove. Um, first of all, you go through the Bible and you see all kinds of commands for us to do this, do that, not do this, not do that. It'd be quite a quite a ridiculous puppet show if we're being told to do things and not do things and God knows that we don't have free will, right? The yeah. problem is we don't know when we are told to do something or aren't, such as like Pharaoh's heart, right? So like, did Pharaoh know that he was being controlled when his heart was hardened uh, in the instance of letting his people go or whatever the story goes like that? I know that's like one of the most commonly brought up arguments. And then- In each of those cases, when, in each of those cases, the Pharaoh hardened his own heart before God hardened his heart. So there's like several references to Pharaoh heart. It was recorded in that one instance that Pharaoh's heart was hardened. But what if there's other instances? Now that we know that it could happen, when does it not happen? Well, that wasn't really defined, right? Mm -hmm. Well, just to finish that thought, like I think what God does is gives us fuel for whatever direction we're going in. This I've discerned this from different angles. It seems like like Romans one, he even mentions that. When some people insist on being rebellious to a certain point, he'll actually go, go get him. You know, he'll, he'll, he'll go, go get him, go destroy yourself. You know, so he gives, he tends to give fuel to people to execute their plans. So some people that are misbehaving yeah, yeah. or in rebellion, he'll go, go ahead, go destroy yourself. So others who are doing good, he'll, he'll encourage us. Sometimes he just encourages what we're up to. Okay. I, I think in the, in the grand, like if we look at the Bible, I think a very intentional act of God giving us free will from the start is putting the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the garden. Like to me, that's God saying, here's your free will. I want you to freely choose to love me. Um, mm -hmm. Or you cannot. So I don't know. I think that's, I think that's a very intentional act by God right from the start. I agree. So what if he didn't put the tree there? Yeah, then we'd be forced to love God. I don't know. So if he did put the tree there and we do have free will and we obviously know the outcome of what happened, and arguably he might have known the outcome of what's going to happen, then all the actions after eating the apple could have been kind of designed 
because he knew of what's going to happen, right? Like, by his design, we sinned against him and then, you know, fell into the rest of the slots that we were supposed to fall into. Like, I don't think his I don't think his designs ever include our sin. He will improvise to make the best of a world that's messed up by our sin. So he'll be graceful in that way, but I don't think God ever incorporates our sin into the plan. That's something we insist on, in my opinion. Because Isaiah says, uh, in Isaiah it says uh, God does no evil. I think there's other uh, scriptures that say pretty, pretty much the same thing. God never plans evil. He never does evil. He does radical things that some people interpret as evil sometimes, but he doesn't proactively do evil. No. Yeah, no, no refuting that one. Yep. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Hi, Annette. Um, Go ahead. A, uh, oh, no. I was going to read Ephesians 1, 4, and 5, and, and a lot of you probably heard this verse. Even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will. Um, yeah, and so I mean, that's so, and I think, um, Norman, that what you just briefly said about, uh, you know, when God put the tree in the garden, you know, he knew it was going to happen, you know, and, and then, you know, we're predestined, so the Bible yeah, I mean, it's, it's, I feel like that's something that I've always thought about. Um, but just because God knows everything doesn't mean he's, we don't know that he's controlling things. I guess the Bible just never speaks to that, right? He doesn't control our will, though. See? Yeah. His will interacts with our will, but he doesn't control our will. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, predestination. I don't know, yeah. This verse, and I, I'm really just reading it for the sake of reading it, about predestining us for adoption, um, has always been something that I've thought about. Never had a great answer for, but, you know. I think it's an interesting um, thought of, uh, an interesting question is, on what basis did he predestine us? Um, we're not saved by works, I'm not saying that, but I think there is, we each have an inclination to uh, accept Jesus given, given enough information or reject him given enough information. Every single soul is either yes or no on that question, right? And I think he predestined us based on his foreknowledge of our nature in terms of that. And I have some scriptures to support that. First Peter one, verse two, well, I'll read one and two. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those chosen living as exiles dispersed abroad in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through the sanctifying work of the Spirit, to be obedient and to be sprinkled with the blood of Jesus Christ. May grace and peace be multiplied to you. Okay, so the key past, the key words in there are chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. Right? According to the foreknowledge of God the Father, right? So according to foreknowledge of something that's going to happen in the future right that doesn't seem to me to refer to god that refers to us god doesn't need foreknowledge about his own decrees you know god is omniscient he doesn't need foreknowledge to you know determine his own plans and so forth that's a reference to his foreknowledge of our in my opinion his foreknowledge of something about us and to me i think it's it seems reasonable that it's a foreknowledge about our inclination whether we would receive Christ given enough information or whether we would reject, reject him given enough information that group you know so I think that's what determines what group we're predestined into you know Romans 8 also says something interesting about that, Let me that one up. predestined or pre-knowledge predestined according to foreknowledge we are predestined according to God's foreknowledge right so, what is that foreknowledge of? I, it would be bizarre to me if that's a reference to God, God referring to his own foreknowledge, God, God's foreknowledge of himself, what? 
why would you need foreknowledge of your own plans? It doesn't, that's just clunky, you know? That's foreknowledge of something else, I think. I think the, the, the natural reading of that is that he foreknows something, it's not God. What does he foreknow? He, I think he foreknows our inclination. Nobody has to accept this. This is my theory on it, but it seems to make sense of the data, you know? Like it's fair, that way it's fair. Then it's not just random. And we're not just people that are damned aren't just damned on randomness. And people that are saved aren't saved on randomness, which would strike me as unfair. Yeah, I don't necessarily see that being very controversial. God knowing whether we would accept him or not, that can't be where the controversy starts. It's God deciding whether we'll accept him or not is where it would be the uh, controversy, right? Um, if he decides it based on our inclination, then if there's any blame, it certainly, it certainly isn't his, right? There's no blame on him because it's because of our inclination that we got selected for damnation or selected for salvation. Right? So I think- I understand that. You know what I'm saying? The objection, a lot of people are real touchy about this because they, and rightfully so, because you know, hopefully God doesn't just randomly damn people. I don't want to, I don't want that to be, right? I want it to be based on something that's legit, right? And if it's based on the inclination, that's legit to me based on like, I see some people that they're just in rebellion. They're never going to accept Jesus. They're, you know, they're into just rebellion, 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 blah, blah, blah. I don't think they should ever be allowed into heaven. They have an inclination that's just, it's just like this all the time, right? Why should they be let into heaven? So I think God, the foreknowledge is the flash forward on you can play out any any conceivable scenario but he he does understand our inclination our wills and so on and so forth and that would be and it would be appropriate to predestine us based on that and it seems to me in romans 8 28 it says we know that all things work together for the good of those who love god who are called according to his purpose for those he foreknew he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son so that he would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters and those he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. But again, in verse 29 there, for those he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. So he, the, the predestination is based on foreknowledge of something. If anybody else has any thoughts, any guesses on what that might refer to, go ahead. No, I think as long as you're careful with your words when you're re-explaining that it's sounds right like can't really see too much of an issue with that the way i'm interpreting it right now maybe this is a bad interpretation and maybe i'm misunderstanding what you're saying as well but the way i'm interpreting it is as if like we're writing a guest list for an event let's say the event is heaven and we're inviting people right okay. um like the way we would do that is by creating that guest list in the given state with the given knowledge that we have right now we don't know like what our friends are going to be doing we don't even know if they're going to live that long we don't know right um but god would know and so his guest list into heaven or like his sanctification his uh you know um salvation is like predestined based on the knowledge of the decision that we would make to accept that invitation right is like what you're saying yes okay then i would agree with that that that'd be a healthy way of looking at it and i'm sure you could point point some flaws in it too and some like you know a, a very well-versed theologian could probably ask some funny questions that could probably disassemble it pretty quick because I'm being very like, you know, maybe I'm abstracting over some details too, um, but I'm pretty comfortable with that. Not saying that I know it for sure, but I'm comfortable with seeing with that understanding. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm open-minded on it. I'm not like locked into that 100%. Like uh, I'll consider if anybody has any other thoughts that I might apply to it, but that's that's my my uh, tentative hypothesis on it you know a sort of rolling conclusion annette i feel bad because i asked you earlier 
how you were doing and I guess there was some audio problem or something, but we haven't heard from you. What do you have to say about all this and that? Your mute there you go. Uh, it's too big of a subject to do in two seconds. Um, we have free will and we're not robots. Good. Good, good. God didn't make us like the angels. And, and the whole thing about free will is um, we have free will to choose whether we're going to follow Christ or, or not. I mean, this all started back in the Garden of Eden. They had free will and free choice. Um, I think the difference between us and Adam and Eve is we have the Bible, we have God's word, and we have a lot more that we know that they didn't have. Okay, and theirs was more like obey and follow me, you know, don't ask questions. And we we have the choice to to ask questions and to pray and to um seek God about situations and stuff mm -hmm. and we have the choice to whether to obey obey and follow or not so mm -hmm. and as far as predestination i don't know i have to reread those verses but and, and i don't have it in front of me mm -hmm. that that um takes a study for me okay well, if you want to look it up later, um, 1 Peter 1 and 2, I'm sorry, 1 Peter 1, verses 1 and 2, and Romans 8, I think it's 29 and 30, that re refer to the foreknowledge, the predestined us according to foreknowledge. But uh, yeah, good thoughts. I guess uh, we've been at this for a while, so any final thoughts, and then we'll get prayer requests. You're muted, Kyle. Thanks, Norman. I gotta go. Uh, I'll type my prayer request. You gonna chat your prayer request? Okay. okay. Good night. Good night. Um, Genesis two, and this this is more on the mind versus uh, brain topic. But Genesis two seven. Then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living being. Um, and this is a whole other topic, but I was thinking about it, but just the, the concept of life being breathed into us um, is pretty crazy. And, and how our life, the, the thought that was coming to mind is like, how, how is our life that God has breathed into us connected to our brain it's like it's like all of a sudden you know you know if i get shot in the head it's too gruesome but um i die and then so like the life that god has breathed into us is connected to our physical bodies then when our physical bodies can no longer function then somehow our, you know, this life that I feel like God breathed into us, which would be like our soul, our mind, all of a sudden moves on to the next dimension. <laughs> it's, I don't know, it, it's just kind of blowing my mind as I was just thinking about it. But, you know, God breathed life into us. And yeah, to me, that speaks to more than just a physical brain, you know, like a some kind of spirit, some kind of mind, some kind of soul. But yeah, that's my closing thought. Kind of interesting that um, Hawaiians have breath and soul as the same word, same as Israelites, you know, ha, you know. And uh, there's something connected to pneuma, pneuma, the Greek, you know, pneumatic, pneumonia, right? pneuma. Yeah, interesting topic for, to, and chew on that one for a long time. Yeah, I think Kyle, what you just said is the significance of uh, that video. However, again, I couldn't exactly follow the video. I'm not 
quite sure that they were going that direction with it, but it's, that's what it would imply is like um, the, the separation between uh, your little noodle up here and uh, your soul. Um, and like how tightly those things are coupled together, right? Um, mm -hmm. Big topic. Yeah. Um, if you guys like that kind of thing, uh, Lee Strobel's written a bunch of good stuff on it. Um, in his case for a creator, there's some good stuff about the several cases of people that had near-death experiences and wound up during that period of time, that several hours or whatever, where they're brain dead, acquiring information from far away that they could not have acquired otherwise. And then the nurses and the doctors fall into their knees and becoming, you know, in, in several cases became believers as a result, you know, they got blown away by it. So it's like, this is not some scam being operated by Westboro Baptist here. These are things that are happening that blow professionals, calm, sober professionals away and cause them to go, my Lord and my God, something happened here that's, that I can't explain, you know, so for further reading, if you're into it, you know. All right, it's probably about time to get prayer requests now. So uh, how can we pray for you, Norm? Praise, praise God that, right on. you know, I have an answer on some career path. I still feel very anxious about it. It feels like so many things can still go wrong. But as far as I know, I got like final approval, just everything in the government. There's always someone who can screw you over. Maybe the president will declare war. Like, <laughs> that could happen you know what i mean it's just like so many variables but for now you know or for always really but praise god that it went this way and i'm very thankful um Hallelujah. and then typical prayer requests you know strength and confidence still leading a new team of people and hopefully i can always consider my image of a believer when i'm around these people and you know inspire them to achieve great things but also consider um you know bigger and mean more meaningful things than just your job career and money and stuff like that so, so hopefully i can yeah perfect man. embody that i'm glad you're thinking about that in terms of your image with your inferiors and so forth that's very good Inferiors, Jeez. quite the word for them. <laughs> that's, that's what I'll call them now. <laughs> um, what is the subordinates? Sorry, what is the internship deal again? I forgot the topic of it. Communications or something? Uh, software engineering. Software engineering, cool. Yeah. Good stuff. All right. Great. And Kyle, how can we pray for you? Kyle. You need some. Yeah, yeah, um, I don't know. I tooth okay. Yeah, tooth is fine. I gotta go. Whatever a buildup is, I gotta get a buildup in like two weeks. Okay. I don't know. I didn't ask questions. Um. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Minimal, minimal pain there um so i don't know i i mean I, I think i'm yeah nothing is really on my mind right now <laughs> uh i've i've had some and i think i've i think i've shared with you guys like uh uh so so kelly is leading worship again this sunday and she did the past sunday so it's been a really nice break for me um so i've been able to relax a little more um and um i've been reading through the book of joshua and, and wrestling with and we've talked about it some here but god um killing entire cities and commanding you know the israelites to not leave any living breathing thing in the cities Jericho and the city of Ai. Um, so yeah, wrestling with it, trying to from a point of view, 
um, you know, not just believe in it and try to justify things, but like an open mind and, you know, try to learn about God and his character. And yeah, I, I have lots of thoughts, um, but currently wrestling with that. So honestly, I would say the biggest thing on my heart right now is for just God really to reveal himself in all of that, and that I can grow my faith. Um, that's what I want. That's what I want. Um, mm -hmm. I'm taking a hard look at it. <laughs> okay, cool. Thanks for sharing that. It's definitely legit. Um, let's see, did I get anything from Annette? I don't see any chats. So, uh, we'll just go. All right, Heavenly Father, thank you so much for uh, the retreat going well and the service and all the things recently that went well. And thank you for letting us have fun as we praise you and, and uh, all the good stuff that's been going on. Please uh, bless Norm in his internship uh thank you so much that he got that and some good things have happened and uh, please uh give bless him with strength and confidence and the ability to um, emphasize the right things to his subordinates and and uh, thrive and excel at his, at his new gig and please bless uh, kyle with his these uh, scriptural things he's wondering about please guide him the right way on those and show him your heart and please give him um Continued relaxation and resolution of the tooth issue. Thank you that that's better. And, and then he's been getting some relaxation, relaxation a break from uh, um, so much uh, having to do worship and all that. Um, and please bless my aches and pains and my relationship with my daughter and uh, all the other things I've been going through. Please let me uh, be able to get my um, overdrawn checking account covered ASAP and not have any more dings on that and uh, just get together with all the little loose ends I've been trying to wrap up and bills paid things that are deferred taken care of I won't go into details but please let me just get all that stuff resolved in Jesus's name we pray amen Man, thanks, thanks Steve. Steve. you're welcome have a good thanks, night. Steve. Thanks, for prayers. thanks for leading I'm see you Sunday if not sooner yeah